Can people hear me? Okay. Um, someone try to say something. Um, I want to see if I can hear you. Hello. Okay, I can hear everyone. Okay, just checking to make sure everything's everything's working right. All right, sounds good. Um, so today we'll sort of continue our discussions about um, you know differences between groups. Um, you know when you're working on the when you're working on if you're looking at the um, if you're looking at the schedule, you probably realize that um, you know relative to what we need to accomplish this semester, we're we're almost done. Um, I think as a group, you can feel pretty good about that. Um, you know, we'll finish we'll finish the material easily um, with with time to spare. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, I'm sort of in the process of grading written assignment seven today. So yes, Lily. Oh, you can finish what you were saying. I just have a question about reading assignment twenty. Okay. Um, so I'm in the process of grading written assignment seven. So I should have that done over the next couple of days, probably. Um, I'll put the solutions up. Um, I think I didn't put the solutions up for written assignment six. I'll need to remember to do that as well. Um, but overall, so far so good. Um, and so I feel like um, I feel like in general the progress in the course is good. Um, so yes, Lily, what's your question? So um, in the second part of reading assignment two. Um, it's asking about the margin of error um, for the, um, yeah, for example, too. Um, I'm wondering if we ever talked about how to do that on StatCrunch. Um, yeah, because. Uh, let me bring it up. So you're talking about reading assignment 20, yes? Yep. Ah, okay. For a minute, I couldn't find it. All right. So you're talking about example two? Yeah, example ah, two. Ah, ah, ah. So the question is about the margin of error for the interval. So I guess on example two, it looks like a confidence interval is reported for the difference of means. And so you sort of see it. Um, the margin of error is actually a lot. You don't, you don't actually need stack crunch to do it. Um, it's a lot easier than you might, than you might guess. Um, it's like a piece of debris on my computer, not a cola. Um, so the, the margin of error calculation, like in a problem like this is quite a bit easier to, to compute than you might guess. The key thing to remember when you're dealing with the confidence interval is that the point estimate for the differences are is always right in the middle of the interval. So to compute the margin of error, what you, you, what you do is you take the interval and you find its midpoint, whatever the midpoint of that interval is, that's, that's the actual point estimate of uh, that's the actual point estimate in that example that would be um, the difference of sample means. So does this make sense so far? Yeah. Um, so to find the margin of error, what you're looking for is the gap between the point estimate and the edges of the interval. So once you understand what the center of the interval is, the margin of error must be the difference between the center of the interval and the edge. And so the, the midpoints, of course, equidistant from the two edges. So you really only need to look at one, one difference. But once you know the middle, um, take the middle, take the, right, take the right end point, subtract the middle number away from it. That's your margin of error. Cool, okay. Thank you. And then, um, uh, bah, 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 bah. I thought I had one more question, but I think you may have answered it. If it comes up, I'll let you know. Okay, all right, yeah, please do. Thank you. Yes, Grace. Hi, sorry, this is just a quick follow up to that example. So when you say you take like the middle value, um, how would you find that? Is that like the mean? Yes. You... Okay, so yes. this one, since it only gives you like the, I guess like the initial interval and then like the control group and stuff, how would you find the mean value since you don't have the actual like data yeah. point? Yeah, right. I mean, you don't you don't have the data or or the point estimate. All you all you have is the confidence interval, right? So I, I guess I guess the thing is. So let me let me write it down now. Maybe maybe it will be more clear um, what I'm trying to say. So let me bring up um, just a blank blank piece of paper. Um, and I'll I'll see. So the question that people are asking about is. The question that people are asking about, you, you should be able to see the document here. Um, it's, it's just about the interval and, you, and you're trying to talk a little about, um, 
you know, the data that you're that you're collecting. So basically you're you're dealing with you're dealing with an estimate of the difference of means. And so a 95% confidence interval was constructed. Um, you're trying to estimate mu sub c minus mu sub t, the mean for the CMP, the, the CPMP students minus the mean for the traditional students. Um, you have some data, you don't actually know what that difference is, you just have an estimate of it. Um, and so you have a confidence interval, and presumably, you know, if you have a confidence interval, you'll, you'll basically already, you'll, you, will, you will automatically have a point estimate. You know, these things are kind of related. So let me write down, um, you know, I'll write down the, I won't write down the interval, but I can't, I'll hopefully give you an idea of what I might mean by that. So remember that in general, the formula For confidence interval, um, I guess I'll just write it CI, always looks like um, your estimate, you know, which, which might vary depending on what it is that you're actually doing, minus the margin of error. Um, and the right, I guess I'm using closed interval, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, um, estimate plus margin of error. And so the estimates the estimate is right in the middle. Now, in context, you know, we, we don't really know what the estimate is. We only have the interval, but we can figure out what the point estimate is because we have the interval. Um, in context, the estimate in this problem um, so let me make sure I get the order of subtraction right. Um, so you're, you're trying to estimate the, the mu of, of the C group minus the mu of the T group, the population means, um, the difference in population means in the two groups that are independent. Um, the estimate is X bar sub C minus X bar sub T, um, or at least it's a, a realization of that it's a number. So um, remember that the approach we're using when we're thinking about estimating the difference of means or the difference of proportions or the difference of the difference of anything, um, at least at least anything reasonable, is that we have um, we have some sample statistics which do the estimation, um, and so it's natural to think that the difference of population means might be estimated by the difference of sample means, and that's all we're really saying here. Um, and so the interval. Um, let me write it down. Oops, I really didn't mean to do that. Undo. Um, so the interval in this particular problem um, is, is this guy right here. So it's 5.573 on the left all the way to about 11.427. So um, probably forget what those numbers are. So maybe here we have that. So we have actual edges, so, but what's reported here um, the number 5.573 is the estimate minus the margin of error. Um, the 11.427 is the estimate plus the margin of error. Um, if you're trying to get a handle, if you want to know, um, so I guess maybe I'll draw, maybe I'll draw a picture and maybe that might be easier. Um, we're sort of saying that our interval stretches from 5.573 all the way up to 11.427. And our estimate is right here. So I guess I should probably give a name to it. Um, so the value of X bar C minus X bar T is right in the middle. And a gap, this gap right here is the margin of error. Um, so does this make sense so far? Yeah, so would you just take the mean of those two values to get that? That's right. Okay. So to, to, I mean, not, not to get the margin of error, but definitely yeah. to find the estimate. The so, yeah, yeah to, to find um, the point estimate, take the midpoint or the average in this case of um, 5.573 and 11.427. And once you have that, 
once you have that, you basically have the margin of error because um, you have the middle point, and you know you can you can take the difference between the middle point and any of the any in either edge in order to determine the MOE, the margin of error, because um, you know the interval is symmetric with respect to this to the center point, right? The the gap on the right and the gap on the left are exactly the same the way that we're building these intervals. And it's nice to, it's nice to revisit that, and maybe talk about it a bit. Um, one reason why that's true, um, it's nice to remember that one reason why that's true, I guess, is that the sampling distribution of the statistics that are doing the estimating are symmetric. Um, you might wonder what would happen if you had an estimator which had a sampling dis distribution which was unusual in some way. Um, this actually happens um, I mean, it won't it won't happen to us, but in subsequent courses, this happens when you when you start talking about um, when you start thinking about um, estimating um, things like variances. Um, so the sample variance is an unbiased estimator of the population variance. So that, that term has a particular meaning. We may get to talk about that at some point. Um, you've already probably seen it, or I might have already talked about it at some point. If you haven't. Um, or if we haven't talked about it in detail, it will definitely show up in the subsequent course. So it has some technical meaning, um, but it turns out that the sampling distribution of the sample variance is not symmetric, um, has the shape of something called a chi-squared distribution with some number of degrees of freedom. You know, so StatCrunch will sort of show you what those look like for, for different choices. And sometimes chi-squared distribution is useful for other types of analysis that we ourselves have done in the class. But that's an example. So, you know, if you're trying to come up with a confidence interval for the variance, you would wonder how to do that, right? Like how would you, how would the family of intervals look um, if the sampling distribution is not symmetric? You feel like you feel like the formula, so to speak, for these intervals ought to appear differently than the ones we're using. Um, that we're capitalizing on various features of the sampling distribution in order to get the formulas that that we're using in the class. Um, so I guess, so does this, does this answer people's questions about that? So I mean, that's what's really going on there. Um, is this all right? Yeah, so on reading assignment 20, um, good. Um, I feel like, um, you know, it's, you know, it's just, you, you know, it's got some short summary, you do a couple of problems. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, I guess this, I guess I should just say it just as a reminder, this reading assignments do, you know, on Friday. Um, and um, Friday at five, that's sort of the usual pattern. There's a homework assignment this week um, on my stat lab, which is due on Monday at five. Um, you know, I don't anticipate, I think there were some issues in turning in one of the more recent homework assignments that were technical. Um, just a reminder, if you had any issues that, you know, it was too slow for you to do, or you um, had some issue like that, just let me know. I don't anticipate anything like that will happen with the next homework assignment, but you never know. So um, make sure and let me know um, you know, if you start working on these things and have, uh, have some technical problem, you know, there's always a workaround for something like that. Um, there's a written assignment eight that's due on Tuesday at five. That's the last written assignment of the semester. So um, depending on how you felt about the reading, the written assignments, I guess that could be either good or bad. Um, if you really like them, maybe you're sad to see them go. Um, you know, so I actually like, I actually like them. Um, you know, I like grading it and kind of gives me insight into what, what people might be thinking. Um, and so I'll remember um, over the next couple of days to put up solutions to written assignments six and seven. So you'll be able to review those and kind of see where things stand. Should be done grading written assignment seven over the next couple of days at some point. I think I've already gone through about a third of them at this time. Um, so uh, I feel good about, I feel good about what I'm seeing. Um, you know, I thought today that we might talk about written assignment seven, but I don't know. I don't know that it's strictly speaking necessary. Um, we'll see maybe how people feel tomorrow. Um, maybe we'll see how I feel tomorrow um, after I grade a few more of them today. Um, so keep doing what you're doing. Um, again, just some long run reminders. Um, we have week, I guess we're in week 12 now. We'll be in week 13 next week. Week 14 is scheduled to be the last week of the course this semester in terms of content. Um, to be honest with you, I feel like we'll be done with the content in week 13. Um, I will offer some bonus material, I think, toward the end of next week and toward the beginning of week 14. I don't intend to put the bonus material on the exam. It's just sort of enrichment. If you want to, um, if you want to pick up some additional stuff that you might see later or you're curious about some things, 
I think we'll wind up doing the chi-square test for independence. So you do some inference for uh, categorical variables. Um, I think we'll do estimates for um, you know, regression coefficients, which looks a whole lot like a t-test as it turns out. So you, know, you have all the tools in order to do that. And sometimes those things show up in subsequent courses. So we'll talk about them. I don't really expect people to learn them that carefully for the final. You've done enough by the time you get to paired data, I think, for the final exam. Um, so the material that will be on the final, we should finish at some point next week. Not really sure when, maybe Wednesday. Um, we'll have some time to review. Um, I'd like the last week to kind of be somewhat low pressure. There'll be an additional homework assignment due on that Monday that covers the last, um, that I feel like covers the last um, bit of material that, uh, that should be on the final and, that, and that's pretty much it. So um, I guess that last week, we'll do a couple of things which are new, but not gonna be on the final. Maybe we'll, and maybe we'll reserve the rest thinking about the final itself. People may have questions about what to expect. Um, you can review the schedule for the, the schedule for the course to kind of see when the final will be. If memory serves, I will release, it'll be pretty much, be very, very much the same as the second and the first exam. I'll just release it one morning and then you know, you'll have a couple of days to do it. Um, you won't have a week because I think the class is scheduled to end officially um, on the day of the final, which I think if we were taking a timed final exam would be on Wednesday, a final exam week. So I have to kind of cut it short a little bit because I have to turn the grades in usually within three days of that date. Um, so I think that's about where we are right now. Um, so things are going well, you should be pleased. Um, I think I'd like to use today just to kind of do some problems. Um, we haven't done that in a while. Um, so I'll tell you what problems to do. Um, it will be helpful today if you have access to the textbook so I'll show you the problems that I'd like you to do using the MyStatLab textbook. Um, and I'll give the, you know, so I'll break into groups and these are problems which are related to chapter 20. So you're comparing groups. Um, some of these problems are kind of familiar, um, but I think it might be more interesting, I think, to try a few of these and then we'll sort of go give ourselves some time to go over them in some detail um, and, you know, talk about, talk about how the inference is actually done. So does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask at this point? Any questions come to mind when I'm saying all of this? Or is it okay? All right, well, if you have anything, um, feel free to interrupt um, at some point. Um, so I'll, I'll break people into groups. Um, looks like we need maybe about six today, seems right. Um, I'm not gonna open the rooms yet because I haven't really, really asked you to do anything. So I'm going to share my screen and I'll sort of indicate where I am. So in the textbook, um, let me get that out of the way, but in, in the textbook you have um, toward the end of each, toward the end of each chapter, a collection of problems in the book. In this particular book that you're using that should be on page 637, it looks like, um, if you want to find the chapter exercises or the exercises in the book, open the multimedia textbook on my stat lab. So you should be able to find that. Um, probably read a lot of the book anyway. So open that. Um, you know, if you if you open the book to whatever particular place you'd recently stopped, there's the option of entering a page number up here, you know, the book will all sort of can be can be instructed to kind of go there. Um, I'd like the groups to think about the following problems. Um, so I'd like them to start maybe um, I'd like I'd like to I'd like them to start maybe with problem 10 and problem 10 is related to problem one. Um, and so this involves some kind of difference of proportions. Um, so start with that. So it may take a minute for the groups to actually find, um, find the location in, in the book. Um, I'd like to maybe think of this in a couple of ways. I'd like stack, first of all, I'd like to be able to kind of come up with the answers using stack crunch, um, you know, just to run the test, kind of see, see what the test looks like um in stack crunch but i'd like to maybe do it in a way that's maybe more more hands-on as well maybe discuss that so start with 10 problem 10 right here it's under section 20.3 on page 636 of the text so i'd like the groups to try 10 10 refers and the setup the problem in 10 is described in one um so that's you know these problems problem 10 and this problem one are actually paired um it involves some sort of estimate of a difference of proportions um, so I'd like, um, I'd like that, that to be the place where maybe we begin the discussion 
but maybe the groups can work on this for a bit. We can kind of come back as a, as a big group and talk about it. Um, so before I break people into groups, do people, the groups understand what I want? Try to solve those problems. You might be able to use StatCrunch to do it um, if you're familiar with, with how to do or come up with a significance test using StatCrunch or construct a confidence interval, then, you know, then you're probably gonna know what to do. So start with that. Um, it's about 116 right now. Just to give the groups time, um, I'd like to, you know, I'd like the groups to like be able to open the book, read the problem, think about it, discuss it a bit. Let's take 10 minutes. So it's about 116 right now. Let's meet again about 126. We'll talk about the problem and then we'll talk about a few more problems after that. Um, so let me give you your, your room assignments. The rooms are now open um, and we'll meet again in, in just a few minutes. This is about the problem. You feel like if you knew that nine corresponded to two, do you, do you feel all right about it? Or if you did 10. Um, <coughs> so is it, do, do people feel okay about what they did? So let's 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 give it a shot. Um, let's, let's sort of see. Um, so this gives me a chance to at least talk a little bit about um, one paired with with nine. Um, so um, I guess on one, you're talking about the standard error of the difference in sample proportion. So um, I'd like to talk more uh, more about this. I guess I guess I should talk more about it. Um, you can get StatCrunch to do this, I think, pretty easily if you have a summary of the data. But I feel like talking about it in more detail. Um, so, so I'll do so. So in general, um, for the difference, um, for estimates involving the difference of P1 minus P2, um, we use the statistic, um, you know, P1 hat minus P2 hat. Now, you know, one and two are sort of generic subscripts. They're, they're meant to suggest you have two independent populations that you're looking at. And there's some concept of a population proportion for both um, that's of interest. So um, you might be talking, if, if, so, so a very trivial example of this would be, well, not, a not so trivial example would be maybe um, you're trying to figure out who's liable to win an election and you have two, two candidate election in which, um, which everyone votes for one or the other candidate. Um, in this case, what dictates the winner is this number right here. But when you're thinking about elections, you never really know what that number is until you run it, the election itself. But a lot of polling is giving you this guy right here where, where you're coming up with estimates for this particular guy right here. Um, so it's important to understand how this guy is shaped. So just like any statistic, um, P1 hat minus P2 hat always has um, sampling distribution. Um, and under some mild conditions. Um, and the author, and I think we probably talked, we've talked about these a little bit, so I don't want to restate them right here. Um, under some mild conditions, um, P1 hat minus P2 hat is, is normally distributed um, with mean P1 minus P2 and standard deviation um, P1, um, one minus P1 over N1 plus P2, one minus P2 over in two. Um, so, you know, the P's that you're talking about, which do not have, which are not sort of, do not have the accent of the hat, these are the actual unknown numbers. Um, when you see things like in one and in two, um, you know, that guy right there, that guy right there, these always refer to things like the size of the sample, and this is assumed to be, to be not the same. Um, so we saw an example of this, I think, on Monday when we were talking about dogs and their, you know, possibility of dogs sort of contracting malignant lymphoma um, on the basis of where, or what kind of home they lived in, um, whether or not that home used herbicides or not. If you go back and look at that example, you're going to find that the, the sample sizes were, were not the same and they don't have to be. Um, and so and there's obviously no, you know, there's no clear relationship between the groups, no assumptions are made, but we still have happened to know this. So the author makes a distinction between this guy right here, um, which 
it's referred to as the standard deviation of P1 hat minus P2 hat. So that's this guy. Um, I always feel like I have to write it down, otherwise it's kind of hard to keep track of what I'm trying to say. Um, so this is the actual standard deviation. Um, the estimate, just, just like when we were dealing with proportions and, and means in the previous chapters, there's also the concept of the standard error of the difference and the standard error of the statistic. And this is where the notation gets a little confusing because um, symbols are used, I think, a little carelessly here uh, because you see that appearing here and over here, but the meaning isn't quite the same. Um, so you're basically what the symbol means to get the standard error of the difference. You basically do the only thing you can do. You replace things like P1 and P2 with estimates of things like P1 and P2, which tends to be and it tends to be what you have in the kind of environment that we're that we're trying to handle in this type of problem. Um, so at least that's, 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 I think, what one is referring to. So what problem one is referring to is something like this. And in context, you know, if you go back to problem one, um, you're basically told the estimates. So advocacy organization is presumably doing the work. They're conducting random samples. So you feel okay about that. Um, you surveyed 960 Canadians, 192 of them um, reported being born in a different, in a different country. Uh, in another country, presumably not Canada. Similarly, 170 out of 1250 US citizens reported being born not in the United States. So you're trying to find something about the standard error. Um, so in this type of problem, so I think I just accidentally shut off the, sorry. I think I shut off the screen share and I didn't quite intend to do that. So let me go back. Um, in, in this type of problem, um, I guess we'll usually, we'll be careful um, in our problem, we'll denote, um, you know, the proportion, you know, the population under study, if it's from Canada, we'll denote that as P sub C. And the proportion that's under study for, for the United States, I guess I'll just put an A there for the United States of America. So um, we have estimates. So these represent the true proportion of Canadians, you know, or Americans, depending on the notation that's used, born um, not in Canada or America, if that's what you're studying. Um, so, you know, at least we know what the symbols mean. And we want to say something about, we would like, we would like to say something about um, P sub C minus P sub A. Um, so if you're talking about, um, you know, if we're talking about trying to perform an inference on this, we have an estimate, we at least have an estimate of this a point estimate, um, we have P sub C hat minus P sub A hat. Um, and in this example, um, what should that be? So P sub C hat should be 192 divided by 960. And P sub A hat should be 170 divided by 1250. And if you carry out the subtraction, you'll probably notice that's a positive number. Um, so before, before I continue, um, are, are people kind of with me, at least in the exposition of the example? You know, we know what the symbols stand for. Um, we can come up with a standard error measurement by using the estimates that come from the point estimates. We can get a number out of it. Um, you can use a calculator to come up with a number if you want, um, but there may be a faster way that we might, we might talk about in just a second. So is everyone okay with this so far? Okay, so maybe back to the problem. Um, 
you know, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to dwell too much on one because, you know, once you know what P hat, sub, P sub C hat and P sub A hat are, it's pretty easy to come up with the estimate. Um, I'd like to think a little about nine. Um, what is the difference in proportions of the foreign born residents in both countries? You know, it, it is what we just wrote down. Um, the difference of sample proportions is that number. What's the value of the T statistic and so on. So um, what are you really trying to, what are you really trying to do with, with this, with this test, uh, with the statistical test that you're talking about? The researchers from exercise one want to test whether or not the proportions of foreign born are the same in the United States and Canada. Um, so if you're thinking about a problem like nine, what would, so I mean, we've done all this, but we've, we've done it maybe to make a statement about this problem nine. Um, what sort of statement do the researchers want to test? Um, they want to test whether or not the, the, the proportion of people born in other countries that, that are citizens of the United States and Canada are the same, whether or not there's evidence against the belief that they're the same or, or equivalently, whether or not there's evidence that they're different. Now, we haven't really done a lot of problems like this, um, though I think you know, a couple of people um, on written assignment seven wanted to do something similar to this. But what I would say on a problem like nine is if you, you know, the problem doesn't say to do this maybe, but you wanna be able to formulate what the researchers are interested in as a statistical hypothesis. And that's a pair of things, right? So that's the null hypothesis and the alternative. In this case, the null would be, would be that P sub C minus P sub A is zero. Um, there is no difference between the population proportions. Now notice we already know that there's a difference between the sample proportions because we can work that out pretty quickly. We can see it, um, but you know it, this might have occurred because of sampling variability, right? Um, maybe the maybe the true proportions are the same, yet you know we just happen to be getting an unusual pair of samples. Um, the alternative hypothesis in this case, if you're testing for a difference, I really think should be p sub c minus p sub a being not zero. Um, and you know, this doesn't look like problems we've done so far because it involves this type of inequality, not equal to. Um, one note I would make here is that this formulation suggests a two-tailed test. And you know, the reason why that is, is because differences, um, extreme values, which would, which would prompt you to think that the null hypothesis, like, uh, which would prompt you to think that you had evidence against the null somehow using this, this framework, um, would appear in both tails. It would appear in a situation where the, where the sample proportions were different in either direction. Um, now, it happens that the sample proportion that you're dealing with is, um, is, uh, is different in one direction, but of course that kind of has to be true. Um, but with a two-tail test, the extreme values in this type of problem, um, in this type of formulation will occur on both sides of the distribution. Um, I'd like you to, you know, you know at some point you, would, you want to go back and contrast this with a type of problem that we've considered quite a bit so far, where we're dealing with one tail test when we're looking for a directed difference. So if you think about the example we were dealing with, I think on Monday with dogs and the proportion of dogs, they got lymphoma from one or another type of household. The alternative hypothesis was formulated in such a way so that you, you had a, the, the direction of the difference mattered. Um, in this case, the extreme values occur on both sides in both tails of the distribution. So there's a distinction between these things. Um, it's a minor distinction. StatCrunch will run the test either way pretty, pretty easily. Um, but you, know, you do, do need to be aware of it because you know, when you're working through these problems, whether or not you're running a one or a two tail test could matter very much, um, you know, it can inform the result you get, um, it might, might matter. So are people with me so far? The key word here is they're testing to see whether or not there's a difference. Um, you don't have to formulate the alternative hypothesis in this way, you could do it in another way. Um, maybe we'll talk about that in just a second, but at least that's the way that this problem is stated. So when, you're, when, you, when we go back to it, um, you know, how do we, how do we run the test? So this is the, this is the formulation of our statistical hypothesis. Um, you know, we can, we can approach this problem in a couple of different ways. You know, we can go back 
and look at the problem, what's the value of the D Z statistic? What do you conclude at alpha equal to 0.05? Um, when you see this alpha equal to 0.05, we're saying that the level of significance is 0.05. Um, so to run this particular test, it suffices, um, and let me, to go to, to go to stack crunch and we'll sort of approach it that way. You can bring it up. Um, and if you bring up stack crunch, when you're dealing with proportions or Z statistics or T statistics, go to stat, proportion stats to sample. And in this case, we don't have the data, but we do have a summary. And so um, when we think about our summary, what, what should we enter? Um, we're gonna call a success here being born in a country that is either not the US or Canada, depending on the proportion that we're studying. So in this case, we go back and we see you know, what that is. So if, if we're thinking about this right here, um, we have 960 people in the sample from Canada. Of those 192 were born in a country that is not Canada. So we can enter 192 here, we can enter 960 here. Um, since, since, since stat crunch takes two away from one, um, we'll think about sample two as coming from the United States. Um, for the US, what do we find? We find that it's 107, we, we find that there are 1,250 Americans randomly sampled and 170 of them were born in a country that is not the United States. So we'll treat things in the same way. We enter 170 right here. We enter one, two, five, zero right here. Um, if we're really trying to conduct a hypothesis test, um, we have to choose the nature of the alternative. I think it's actually set in a way that we find convenient. We're looking at P1 minus P2 being different from zero. That's actually what, what we're trying to study. Notice in this case, you have various choices, but this is probably the one that makes the most sense. Um, when we hit compute, we kind of get everything all at once. Um, <coughs> we, we get a standard error of about 0 0.015, 0 0.016. You know, we would have calculated that anyway, I think, in question one. We get a value for the Z statistic on the order of about point, or 4.02. <coughs> we get a difference of proportions um, about 0 0.064. <coughs> Excuse me. So 0 0.064 doesn't look like a very big number. Um, and yet in context, it is because the standard error is so small, that has a lot to do with the size of the sample. So the Z statistic is quite large. Um, whenever you see a Z statistic on the order of about 4.02, you're thinking you got a result from the sample, which is about four standard deviations to the right of what's expected if the null hypothesis is in fact, the case, if, if the null hypothesis is in fact true. Um, you can calculate the P value directly, I think, if you, um, if you happen to know the standard error in the normal calculator, Luckily, <coughs> StatCrunch already gives it to you. Says, <coughs> excuse me, says the p-value is quite small. So whenever you see something like 0 0.0001, um, you'll, you'll see this a lot. It basically just sort of runs out of room to put the zeros in. Um, four standard deviations to the right of the expectation under the null is quite, um, quite large, even in the two-tailed environment. So you get a p-value of about 0 0.0001. Um, so, oops. Didn't mean to do that, sorry. So what should we actually do? So let me write down a couple of more things. Um, the Z stat, the value of the Z statistic, uh, the value of the test statistic is about 4.02. Notice that's pretty large and the P value is small. Um, doesn't really report exactly what it is, um, but StatCrunch reports less than 0 0.0001. So the visualization maybe of what we're seeing is this. So the distribution of P1 or PC hat minus PA hat looks a bit like this. The distribution of the test statistic is centered over zero. Um, the test statistic we're actually looking at um, <coughs> looks like, <coughs> um, I, need, I need to sort of abbreviate here a bit. P1C minus P, P hat C minus P hat A divided by the standard error of um, P hat C minus P hat A. Looks like this, um, it's distributed in this way. So what we're saying is we get a value over here that looks like 4.02 
And the p-value that you're getting, since it's a two-tailed test, is the area that's concentrated in both of the tails. And again, the reasoning here is if it's a two-tailed test, if you're looking at a difference, a difference, an extreme value that's far away from an expectation of zero for that test statistic can occur over here or it can occur over here. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. So what's the actual conclusion? Um, what we would say, I think, is that um, at a significance level of 0.05, we'd reject, we'd have enough evidence to reject the null, the null hypothesis. So we have evidence in favor of the alternative that there is indeed a difference. Um, I'd like to treat this problem in more than one way. Um, so I'll write down what I have in mind. Um, we can also calculate a 95%, uh, a 95% confidence interval for, um, for the difference in proportions. Um, we can pretty much immediately do this in StatCrunch. Um, I'm about to do it, but as I'm sort of getting into position to do it on StatCrunch, you should ask yourself, given the result that we just got, would we expect the confidence interval to contain zero? Um, so pa you know, pause for a moment, think about it. I'll edit this as though I kind of want to change my mind and compute a 95% confidence interval in this situation. I compute, you know, StatCrunch is almost too good. Um, it sort of comes up with um, the confidence interval more or less immediately. <coughs> Notice that the lower confidence limit looks like about 0.032. The upper confidence limit looks about like 0.0996, let's, let's say to be generous. Um, and so we get you know, 0 0.032, 0 0.096. Notice it doesn't contain zero. <laughs> Um, and so when, we're, when you're thinking about this type of problem, I would say that the results you get when you conduct the significance test and the results that you get when you construct the confidence interval, they had better be consistent. Um, <clears throat> this is also a point that I think it's worth making when we're thinking about the problem on written assignment seven. It's similar. So when you're thinking about written assignment seven, um, if you're going back and reviewing it at some point, it's got a similar feel, except it's one proportion rather than two. So for that particular problem, you also constructed a confidence interval and that confidence interval didn't contain um, 0.5. Um, that, that, was, that was sort of how that particular problem worked if you remember it. Um, so whenever you do these two things, there's often not a reason to do two. If you're doing a two-tailed test and you're constructing a 95% confidence interval, the truth of the matter is these are basically equivalent inferences. Um, the author discusses this a little bit in chapter 19, but doesn't dwell on it that much. So when you're thinking about a problem like this, often people will build a confidence interval just to kind of try to sort out where the parameter is. If you find that your confidence interval contains a number like zero, you kind of already have evidence that, or you, you kind of already don't have enough evidence to reject the null um, if you're running, say, a two-tailed test. Um, if you know where the parameter is kind of at, like in, prob like in, like in written assignment seven, had you done the last part of that problem first, you, you kind of would have already guessed you know, where, where the other results were leading. Um, namely, that there was evidence against the null in written assignment seven. Um, so, you know, confidence interval construction, I mean, of all the things that I think are important to take away from the class, you know, being able to think about what sort of evidence that you can gather from a confidence interval, I feel like that's really something you should take away. Often results in scientific papers are presented um, with the null hypothesis significance testing framework. So you should be familiar with the language but often people also just sort of will tell you what the confidence interval looks like and expect you to kind of draw the right conclusions from it. So be aware that there's a relationship um, between those things. So I'm kind of tried to make that point in the solutions to written assignment seven. Um, but, um, but again, I'd like to emphasize that. Um, it's, it's important to take that away from the course. So um, anyone have any, any questions about this so far? We've done that problem nine, um, I guess pretty thoroughly, maybe more thoroughly than uh, and then was really demanded of us. Um, <clears throat> there's about four minutes left in class today. So I don't feel like I can really include anything more in four minutes. Um, I could try to shoehorn an additional problem in, but you know, I don't think I'll do that. 
Um, so I'd like to sort of leave it right there. Um, tomorrow, we will probably do another problem or two, but I would like to use tomorrow to talk a little about pair differences. So, you know, if you have time, if you only if you have time, only if you have time, read, you know, the first couple of sections of chapter 21. If you don't have time, don't worry about it. You, you'll get a chance to read them next week. Um, but my intention is maybe to do one, maybe two more problems tomorrow, give people a chance to try to get their feet wet with the calculations. Um, and then, and then maybe spend, you know, the remainder of the time on Thursday, getting ahead a little bit for next week, at least introducing the idea of paired data, which for us represents a major violation of the independence assumption between groups. It's, it's the one, it's important enough where it's the one violation that the author really points out, thinks that this is important, thinks that this is worth mentioning, um, and goes into some detail describing, you know, why, why he thinks that. So um, I guess right now it's about 152. I think I'll probably leave it at that. Um, so have a good day. I'll spend the next three minutes around here in case anyone has any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you.